Hi everyone, welcome to Five Code Shakespeare Hamlet Character Analysis. In this series, we look at a total of nine different characters, all of them in fact, and in this video, we'll look at Gertrude. What I do in each video is first identify important characteristics of each character, and then we identify and analyze several quotes that prove the claim. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe, and you can instantly download a copy of the PDFs I use in this series by visiting my shop and making a one-time purchase. See the description for details. Of all of Shakespeare's characters, Gertrude is perhaps one of the most fascinating. I find her a fascinating character. She is an enigma. Um, what I'm going to talk about today are I've got five different character traits that may be true of her, uh, but everything about Gertrude is an open question because Shakespeare famously uh, doesn't give us a lot of information about her. Uh, Shakespeare does that a lot, by the way. He does. He very often just shows and not tells. So there's a lot of things that are omitted from characters' uh, um, personalities and and motives, especially uh, a great actor like Penny Downey in Hamlet 2009, that version uh, can bring out a lot. And, and watching her, you can start to see how potentially she uh, is perhaps a guilty adulteress. She is a heroic Juliet, perhaps. She's an accomplice to murder, question mark. She's a cunning opportunist, probably. And she's an Oedipal mom, probably. Okay, so all of those are open questions, but we're going to examine them and try to piece together uh, some truths about her uh, using using as much evidence as we can find. Okay, first of all, guilty adulteress, question mark. So this is one of the biggest questions and mysteries of the play. Was Gertrude sleeping with Claudius while her husband was still alive? So is she an adulteress? Was she an adulteress? It's unclear whether Gertrude was sleeping with Claudius while King Hamlet was alive, but there is some evidence to suggest that she was. I've read both sides of the argument and to be honest it's really hard to come down on one side firmly uh, or, or on the other um, but i'm going to argue yes i i think yes and here are my reasons so the ghost seems to say as much in his exposition so when we first hear the ghost in act one scene five he he's he's telling hamlet uh, uh what what happened and he says that incestuous that adulterate beast claudius my brother with witchcraft of his witch with wits with traitorous gifts oh wicked gift wit and gifts that have the power so to seduce he won to his shameful lust the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. Now that word is important here. Uh, a few words also are important. Adulterate, again, it sounds like it's evidence because it sounds like adultery in our, in our ears, but in Shakespearean language, it could simply mean corrupted, okay? In which case the incest problem and the, and the quick marriage might simply be enough to uh, uh, um, encompass that word adulterate. But it also has a secondary meaning of defiled, to be defiled by adultery. So is he saying that she committed adultery? Sounds a bit like it. Again, you put that together with some other evidence and maybe we have an argument. Uh, will here, so Claudius won the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. Will here doesn't mean your, your, uh, your ability to act in the world or your desire to act in the world. It actually had, in Shakespeare's time, it actually meant sexual desire, your will. So that's, that's another indication. Uh, most important for me, I think, is the word seeming. Uh, she seemed to be virtuous while we were married, do you see? But all that time, she wasn't. Does that prove that she was having uh, an affair, or at least the husband thinks so? Uh, also, if we analyze the poetry here, uh, the, the consonants uh, are pretty nasty sounding. Uh, uh, the S's and T's, S's tend to hiss, and, and T's tend to explode and pop and, 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 uh, uh, and spit. So the consonant sounds, the hissing, spitting S and T sounds, suggest a bitterness and anger. Now, that bitterness and anger, does it simply come from the fact that she married Claudius after I died, which is incest by law, or is it? Is it? it but it's, it sounds to me a bit too bitter and angry. Uh, um, so that suggests to me a betrayal and deception. If she married the brother two months after, you know, the king died then that's simply betrayal. And it's enough reason to be angry and bitter, I suppose, but the deception would make it even worse, do you see? And that might uh, explain some of this, the, the venom in this speech. In the closet scene, when Hamlet is, is ripping her, his mother to shreds, Gertrude is in fact tortured. She's absolutely tortured with guilt, suggesting adultery rather than mere in-law incest. Now, back in Shakespeare's day, marriage to a spouse's sibling, uh, even if it's not a blood relation, an in-law marriage was actually forbidden as incest. It was considered incest. However, it was very often winked at, most famously by uh, Henry VIII. Uh, <clears throat> so it is it. 
It's not that big a deal, perhaps you could argue, and it wouldn't explain why she's absolutely tortured with this guilt. Three times, three times in the play, she basically says, no more, no more, you're, you're ripping me to shreds, no more, no more. So she says to Hamlet here, when Hamlet's you know, accusing her of, of a lot of different things, and uh, betrayal is, is prime among them, she says, oh, speak, no more, uh, speak to me no more, these words, like daggers, enter my ears, no more, sweet Hamlet. So those daggers stick deep, and if it was simply... She starts off defiant. I'm going to explain later on, too. She starts off defiant. She says, what have I done that's so bad? Well, that sounds like maybe she, yeah, she, it was a hasty marriage, but I love the guy, and I didn't do anything else wrong but love this guy, who was perhaps the wrong guy, but I still love him, so I'm, I'm to blame for nothing. But that's not what's playing out here. She, she is racked with a guilt that sounds to me deeper than simply uh, an or hasty marriage. Um, to support that claim, the ghost pities Gertrude. Uh, um, twice in the play, uh, the ghost tells Hamlet to go easy on the mom. The ghost pities Gertrude, uh, but insists that her guilt is very real and implies that she will be punished in heaven for her transgression. So again, is it just an or hasty marriage and, and an in-law incest problem, or is it deeper than that? So here's where he says to Hamlet in Act 1, Scene 5 again, But howso, howsomever thou pursuest this act, taint not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive against thy mo mother ought. Don't touch your mother. Don't hassle your mother. Leave her to heaven and to those thor thorns that in her bosom lodge to prick and sting. Again, he's very sensitive to how she feels. Uh, he's aware that what she did was a crime in the eyes of heaven. Uh, now, King Henry VIII got away with in-law incest. So why wouldn't Gertrude? Do you see what I'm saying? So it sounds, again, a bit more serious than mere in-law incest. It, it's adultery, which would be punished severely in heaven and would cause her those uh, uh, not just regret, not just regret, but pricks and stings of conscience, which, as we've seen up here, are very, very real indeed. So Gertrude marries Claudius only two months. Now, this is probably the most damning evidence. Uh, she marries him only two months after her husband dies. And throughout the play, Shakespeare emphasizes the speed of the marriage, which suggests that they were already in love or already in cahoots, if it's a political arrangement or a convenience arrangement, uh, before the death. That's pretty damning, actually. Uh, two months. Here's a happy couple. She's pretty darn happy. How long ago did your husband die? You know, just give it a bit of time before you get married. If you do indeed love him and it is a, a, a legit relationship, just give it a six months, you know, if you did respect your, your former husband. So here's evidence, of course, that, that it was a, a most wicked speed that uh, um, with which they got married. So almost wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. So there's the two elements there. One is the incest and the other one is the, uh, the, the speed of the marriage. And Gertrude herself admits that the marriage was too fast. I doubt it is no other. So Hamlet, Hamlet's distraction and madness is, is caused by nothing else but the main issue, which is the fact that his father died and our or hasty marriage, the fact that we got married, married too soon. So uh, was it mere in-law incest or was it in fact uh, uh, adultery? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for adultery, but you tell me what you think in the comments. All right, so was she a, a heroic Juliet character who was following indeed her true heart? Married to a guy she didn't love and fell in love with the brother who she really loved? Was she that kind of hero? Let's have a look. The Western notion of true love was kind of invented by the troubadours. Um, they were traveling uh, minstrels and poets and storytellers uh, that would tell tales of, of, uh, of, of romance, forbidden romance, which was the most delicious. And it became, it became a phenomenon. Way, way back in, in, the, in, the, in the Middle Ages, the early to mid Middle Ages, uh, um, stories of true love in defiance of social convention were really, really popular in, in the court. And for very good reason, because very often marriages, well, almost always, uh, uh, marriages were a marriage of convenience. So we can apply this to uh, a lot of Shakespeare's plays because he inherited that medieval tradition of the troubadours. Uh, and in Romeo and Juliet, it's there. And in Midsummer Night's Dream, it's there. The idea that true love is something different than political love or economic love. So we can ask that question of Gertrude. She leaves or abandons, at least, uh, a one husband, the official proper husband, and follows her true love in the way that Romeo and Juliet do it. 
do you see? So what drove Gertrude to Claudius? Was it expediency? Did she merely marry Claudius because he provided her with the queenship? I'm going to argue that today. That's a very good possibility. Or was it real true love? Maybe she loved Claudius a lot more than she loved her former husband. The troubadours from the medieval southern Europe is where it started, invented the idea of true love, courtly love. You can you can Google these and you'll, you'll, you'll see some stuff. It's really fascinating. It's really, really interesting. And it forms the basis, one of the strong bases of Western civilization. Our notion of marriage comes from these guys. Very interesting. So they preached or their stories, uh, their stories argued, you know, in, in storytelling fashion that love was something transcendent. It was not bound to practical earthly matters of politics and economics, which is what most marriages were back in those days. Uh, love was a struggle was seen as a struggle uh, between self and society. Then I've talked about this in many of my videos, my Wasteland video as well. Uh, you have to be true to yourself. Love is a true expression of the true self. Uh, and doesn't matter what society says, you have to follow your true self. Otherwise, you're living an inauthentic life. You're living in a wasteland. And that's the, that's the foundation of so many stories uh, in the Western tradition. Uh, it was the, in, the invention of none other than the actual individual. The idea that you are separate from your family, you are separate from your, your, your culture, from your society, from your tribe, that, that comes from this troubadour tradition. Love is a cure for the wasteland caused by inauthentic living, especially a political marriage. Uh, the, the famous examples were um, uh, Sir Lancelot and Guinevere from the from the Arthurian romances. She's married politically; it works. I don't, I can't, I can't remember, but I did read all these stories. But I, did she hate her husband and fall in love with Lancelot, or merely that her husband was fine? You know, the arrangement was fine, but the spark, the transcendent spark of true love, true self-expression uh, was found in, in good old Lancelot. That's, that's a question. And again, we can apply it to Romeo and Juliet, to Midsummer Night's Dream, and here we can ask the question of Gertrude and Claudius, are they as important uh, heroic lovers as Romeo and Juliet? Uh, and of course, these, uh, these troubadour stories uh, were deliciously tragic, of course. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, great tragic story, and Forbidden Love and Titanic. That's that's how fundamental the troubadour's uh, worldview is to Western society. It's all over the place in our popular culture, and Titanic, we see it here. This is an elopement scene from the back of a mirror, an ivory mirror, and you can see the queen uh, uh, being uh, whisked away by Sir Lancelot uh, to go off and live their true selves. And that's from way, way back in the 1300s. Very, very, very interesting. Okay, so Shakespeare developed uh, develops this theme in plays like Romeo and Juliet, Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, Twelfth Night. And in Hamlet, the audience must speculate on Gertrude's motives. What were her motives? True love? Or did she marry uh, Claudius out of true love? That true troubadour kind of self-expression love? or pure expediency because she gets to keep her queenship. So uh, here's an argument in favor of, of her living an inauthentic life with King Hamlet. She, she wasn't truly in love with King Hamlet and she actually fell in love with, uh, 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 with the brother, Claudius. Did she feel smothered by an overprotective husband? Now Hamlet says here uh, in his first soliloquy, he says, oh, King Hamlet, my father, was so loving to my mother that he might not be teamed the winds of heaven to visit her face too roughly. Now, I've used this as evidence that, yeah, the, the husband was a really good husband, and it's probably true too, but this kind of love, was it overprotective? Uh, was, was, was she living like a bird in a gilded golden cage? It's golden, but it's a cage nonetheless. Uh, was Claudius actually a breath of freedom? Because there's lots of evidence I'm going to prove uh, down here, prove actually, not suggest, prove that, that uh, Claudius was a fun guy. He was a fun, raunchy kind of guy. And and this sounds like he's a bit like the, the first husband was a bit too, too perfect. Like Superman, a smug, perfect guy. Imagine being married to that. Um, go watch my King Hamlet video and I'll talk about uh, this in a, in a bit more detail, but I'm going to focus on Gertrude today. Married to perfection, Superman, did she feel unworthy? So not just kind of smothered by the perfection, but actually did it made her feel small. If you're living with a god, what are you? What are you? And Hamlet says here uh, uh, about, in the same soliloquy, he says about uh, King Hamlet, and, I, and I've argued in my previous videos that, yeah, it's probably partly true. He compares her, he compares his father to, to gods, and not just one god, but all gods and all uh, domains of achievement. His father was amazing. Now, again, imagine being married to that. So see what a grace was seated on this brow, and he's showing 
or, or he's, he's imagining a picture of his, of his father. Hyperion's curls, that's the sun god. The sun god is the god of reason and art and science and all of the enlightened, noble aspects of our, of our being. He's like Jove, which is Zeus, okay? A, 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 a ruler uh, of order and good governance, do you see? He's good at that. And I like Mars, he's a great warrior. That's the god of war. And a station uh, to threaten and command, a station like the herald Mercury. He's the he's, uh, Mercury Hermes. He's the messenger god. And he was very, very clever and very witty in speed uh, and, and, and just an all-around great uh, 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 counterbalance, clever. He was kind of like an Odysseus character. He was a clever guy in comparison to these more rigid kind of gods. gods. He was a bit more raunchy. Anyway, so uh, perfect. There he is. You're married to a perfect guy. I think that's going to be that's that's going to could smother you, and it could actually make you feel in, inadequate. And did Claudius make Gertrude feel more worthy? They're more the more equal, and they had more fun together. They had they were more of a kindred spirit. Do you see? Can you be kindred spirit with this? Um, that's that's a really good question. Similarly, did she feel trapped and simply bored by her virtuous puritanical king? Now again, go back and watch my Puritan Puritanism video and watch the King Hamlet video, and I argue that he is a bit of a prig. He is a bit of a, a, a like his son. His son got his puritanical elements from the father, and I think that's probably true. Uh, was he a no fun king? Uh, here's the ghost complaining uh, of 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 people having fun sexually. The ghost says, but virtue as it never will be moved, though lewdness courted in the shape of heaven, so lust, though to a radiant angel linked, will sate itself in the celestial bed and prey on garbage. So he's saying here basically that lewdness and lust can never win, can uh, will always win over virtue. Virtue can never defeat lust. We will always end up preying on garbage. Okay, our lust will sate itself and prey on garbage. Now, garbage in the Elizabethan language uh, didn't just mean our regular garbage; it actually meant the guts of a dead creature, animal, or human. DC. So it's really, really nasty. There's this image of the body uh, as 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 absolutely corrupt and contemptible. And I've argued in my videos that both Hamlet and King Hamlet, the father, uh, have a real problem with sex. Uh, they're puritanical. Uh, sex is depicted here as garbage. There's a contempt for physicality. Again, it's not just household garbage. It's rotting guts of a, of a dead creature. So there's a contempt for physicality here. So in which case, if you're married to that guy, was Claudia simply more fun, more suited to Gertrude's perhaps extroverted temperament, perhaps? I mean, in the, in the opening scene here, uh, um, uh, Penny Dow Downey depicts uh, uh, depicts Gertrude as someone who really enjoys uh, uh, being in in the in the spotlight, enjoys uh, um, life at, at court. Uh, so here's here's Hamlet complaining to Horatio, okay, about how much Claudius likes to party. Would you like to be married to a party guy? You might. You really, really might as opposed to a stifling Puritan. So Hamlet says, the king doth wake tonight and take his rouse, keeps wassail and the swaggering upspring reel. So they're partying and drinking again. Oh my goodness. And Horatio says, is it a custom? Do they do it all the time? And Hamlet sighs and says, yes, they do it all the time. Mary, it is a custom. But to my mind, it is a custom more honorable if you break the custom than if you observe the custom. So, so not a fan of partying. Claudius, definitely a fan of partying. So did Gertrude willingly leave behind her her husband and enjoy her life a little bit more so social expectations be damned you are my one true knight in shining armor that's a possibility look at penny downey here she's obviously her and the director decided to have her really love claudius so it's really quite interesting uh to take it a step further did she love him so much that she was an accomplice to murder now, for the record, I don't believe Gertrude was an accomplice to murder, but Shakespeare being the troll that he is, he drops these hint bombs into the play and, and he makes he forces our imaginations to kind of question whether or not it is a possibility. Uh, I don't think so, but, but here's, here's some evidence uh, to suggest that maybe a director uh, could, could quite, actually, no, not maybe, quite easily, I believe, a director could 
film Gertrude as this Machiavellian uh, Lady Macbeth kind of character. So let's have a look at it. So Shakespeare is a coy troll, a master of omission and suggestion. He very often leaves only hints and clues about characters' motives and personalities. We're looking at motives now. Why did she marry Claudius so soon? Uh, he, Shakespeare shows rather than tells, which is what good storytellers do, by the way. Uh, even, in, even in soliloquies uh, where Shakespeare is is telling in a soliloquy. Iago in Othello, for example, will say, I hate the more because of these reasons, and I'm going to tear him down because of these reasons. We do hear his motives, and we, we believe them. But in a lot of soliloquies, like Hamlet's, you can't trust the voice, because even if even if you are talking to yourself, dear viewer, you very, we very often don't know that we're lying to ourselves, but we do. That's how complex psychology is, and Shakespeare was a master psychologist, and he's a master troll as well. Uh, so likely Gertrude is not a Lady Macbeth Machiavelli, and I don't think she plots with Claudius, but again, these, the suggestions are there. And the hints and clues of her involvement in the murder are merely Hamlet's suspicion. So there's two, evident, there's two locations in the play here where Hamlet directly suspects her of, of, of murder. But the suggestion is there, even though it's simply coming from Hamlet's uh, uh, suspicions. The suggestion is there, and a director could easily uh, choose to make her a Machiavelli and Lady Macbeth rather than naive, because... If she's not Machiavellian in some sense, then she's definitely naive. If she's not at least a cunning opportunity uh, opportunist who, yeah, okay, she falls in love with Claudius, but it's a convenient love because she, main, she maintains her queenship, do you see? If she's not that kind of smart person, then she's kind of stupid. And, and the, the 1996 Kenneth Branagh version depicted her as a real dingbat. I really don't like that version of Gertrude. This, her version of Gertrude is much more real, much more of, of, what, uh, of, of what a real woman, how a real woman behaves. Uh, this is wrong, by the way. It's uh, Act 3. I, I will change this in the PDFs. Uh, it's Act 3, Scene 2. When he's getting ready, he's getting ready to go in and confront Gertrude in this uh, uh, closet scene. And he says, oh, I have to confront my mother and I'm going to give her a piece of my mind, but I'm not going to harm her. He says, O oh heart, lose not thy nature. Let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. Now, the story of Nero, the, the Roman emperor, directly mirrors the situation with Claudius Gertrude and King Hamlet, do you see? It, it really does. And that's not an accident. Shakespeare read widely in, uh, in, in ancient uh, Roman history and the stories, and he knew what was going on. He even named Claudius after the Roman emperor, Claudius, do you see? So there's lots of echoes about what happened. And here's the story. Nero plotted his mother's, Agrippina's, murder. She was niece and wife. So there's the incest. She was niece and wife of Roman Emperor Claudius. The mother was accused, the wife was accused of poisoning her husband and living with her brother. That's from uh, uh, Hamlet, the Arden version. So there it is. It's a mirror. Why did Shakespeare put that in there? Because he's a troll. He's a troll. He's a wonderful troll. And he's having fun with us. Uh, so Hamlet suspects sub somewhat subconsciously here, but not, not really subconsciously, that, that this, this situation is, applies to uh, his current situation. Later on, even more damning, in the closet scene, he actually directly accuses her. He directly accuses Gertrude of, mur uh, of murder. He says here, uh, Gertrude says, you shot somebody, you killed somebody, what bloody deed is this, says Gertrude. And Hamlet says, a bloody deed, almost as bad good mother as kill a king and marry with his brother. And she responds, as kill a king? And this is, this is the moment, this is the screenshot where she says, as kill a king? Now, that acting suggests that it's genuine shock. She's not, uh, she's not Machiavellian. She's more naive in the, in, the, in the ways that we just talked about. Okay, so uh, a good, so, so yeah, so there's two suggestions here that she did collude with uh, Claudius to kill the brother, but again, it's coming from Hamlet. Uh, and interestingly, uh, why doesn't she or he pursue the ac accusation? Probably neither really wanted an answer. Uh, Hamlet doesn't follow up on this, and Gertrude doesn't follow up on this. Events just just roll on. Probably they didn't even want to think about it. Uh, uh, her, she didn't want to think of her son thinking of her as a murderer. Oh my goodness, a terrible, terrible thing. And he didn't want to consider any f deeper the fact that his mother might be a murderer. Subconsciously and psychologically, we do that kind of stuff, right? Uh, besides her shock at Hamlet's accusation, which again, I, that suggests that, yeah, she, she didn't know what was going on. So in fact, she was naive. Um, Besides the shock at Hamlet's accusation, her initial confident defiance, this is her at the beginning of that scene, her initial confident defiance at the beginning of the scene suggests she tries to feel no regret for the lesser crime of loving, marrying, and sleeping with Claudius. Now, what order 
will determine adultery or not uh, is another question. But she, at the beginning, she says, what? She says, what? what have I done? She says, what have I done that thou darest wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me? That suggests that she doesn't have the guilt of murder on her conscience, do you see? Because she's not a, she's not a psychopath. If you're a psychopath, you would say, what have I done that is so, that is so bad? What have I done? Even if you're a murderer, a psychopath can project like that. But she, she, she doesn't. It's a, it's a fragile confidence. And so it's not, she's not a psychopathic Machiavelli. And Hamlet says, such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty. So you're basically a whore is what he's saying. Again, adultery or even just, uh, you know, uh, the, um, the in-law incest. It doesn't matter. You're, you're a whore. And Gertrude says, I, me, what act that roars so loud and thunders in the, in, in, in the index? What she's basically saying there is the act of love and marriage is no crime, boy. I love Claudius and I slept with Claudius. Yes. And what, do you, what problem do you have with that puritanical little boy who doesn't understand life? Uh, that's that's that, that's one interpretation of it. Another one would be: Does, Doth she protest too much? Is in this defiance is she protesting too much? Is she trying to convince herself that she did no wrong? You see, I didn't do anything wrong. Why are you so angry with me? When in fact she actually does, because this is a fragile confidence, and she does crack. She absolutely cracks. And as I've mentioned already, she, three times or more, she says, "Please stop! You're torturing me, son." Is she trying to convince herself that she did no wrong and really did marry Claudius out of love? Maybe in back of her mind, she's trying in the back in the back of her mind, in her deep soul, she knows that she doesn't love Claudius. She just married him for expedience so she can keep her queenship. And she's trying, again, we lie to ourselves, and she's lying to herself and saying, No, I married him out of troubadorian love. Do you see? It's true love that I'm following. And so why are you angry with me for following my true heart? Is she protesting too much and she doesn't really believe it uh, at a subconscious or, or, or an interior level? It's such, a, such an interesting character. Shakespeare's such a genius. Okay, this, is, this to me comes closest to the truth, I think. I think she's probably a cunning opportunist. There's lots of evidence in this play to suggest that Gertrude was no saint, no saint at all. And I've got, I think, four or five different uh, examples of how she was perhaps a cunning opportunist or at least a, 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 a dirty dealer in her own right. Um, I think she was a cunning opportunist. That, that's, that's what I believe. I, marriage has always been an expedience, a means of achieve, to achieve security, status, and money. So why wouldn't she participate in, in that game if that was the game on offer, do you see? If Gertrude was not a murderous Machiavelli or truly in love with Claudius, which means that she's a naive victim of his charms, if, if that's not the case, then she may simply be a clever exploiter of the advantages presented to her. If this is the way life is, men pursue careers in this path. Women pursue careers in this path. All right, I'm going to play the game. Did she enjoy the power and status of the queenship too much to take the high ground and refuse or even delay Claudius? Why did she marry so fast? Was it out of true love? Perhaps troubadourian self-expression love. Or maybe she just said, no, I'm, 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 I really, 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 really like my queenship. So Claudius says here in, in his opening speech when he's announcing a, a political news with Norway and, his, and he's announcing openly his marriage uh, uh, with, with Gertrude, he says, Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress to this warlike state, have we taken to wife. Now, that's a big word. That word means that, yeah, she is a co-ruler with this guy. Now, he's using that. Uh, I've read in a few places that he's using that somewhat metaphorically, but it doesn't matter. The imperial jointless, jointress is a pretty big title, and, and it does carry some weight. So, smart power play? I think so. Throughout the play, Gertrude is will Gertrude willingly participates in the corruption of the wasteland. So again, I'm trying to prove here that she's not perfect and she is playing a game, a Machiavellian kind of game, not murderous, but a Machiavellian game nonetheless, which everybody in this play is trying to trying to play. Uh, again, go and watch my wasteland uh, uh, video, and I've got more information about that. So throughout the play, Gertrude willingly participates in that, that corruption. Here we go. She demonstrates a shrewd cynicism when dealing with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. She says to them, she says, your visitation shall receive such thanks. Thanks for coming to spy on my son. Thanks for coming and your visitation shall receive such thanks as befits a king's remembrance. That's a kind of corruption. Would you, ladies and gentlemen, pay someone to spy on your son? Pay them? Not out of a favor. You know, could you just watch him because he's having problems? No, pay him. Spy on my son? 
will make it worth your while. So there's a kind of cynicism. There's a wasteland corruption, do you see, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't paint her in a good light, uh, which helps add uh, 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 evidence to the fact that, yeah, maybe she's, maybe she's not perfect. Maybe this, this isn't a true love uh, uh, that she's following. With corrupt, here's some more evidence. So with corrupt Polonius and Claudius, she helps to manipulate Hamlet and Ophelia. Is she being naive or is she being as devious as Polonius and Claudius? She helps them spy on her son, do you see? Does she honestly think it's a good thing to, to do? Or, is, or, or does that even suggest that that's a kind of form of deviousness in itself? Uh, most damning of, of all, I find this horrible when uh, uh, Polonius reads the love letter out loud to the freaking court, right? Could you imagine having your parents read your intimate love letters aloud to society. I think that's an absolute betrayal. And I talk about that in my betrayal video. Uh, it, it's a terrible thing to do. And Gertrude doesn't protest. She doesn't protest when Polonius violates the young lover's privacy by reading their intimate letters. She actually says, are you sure this letter came from Hamlet? Is this what we're reading? And Polonius says, yep. And he reads the letter aloud. Really embarrassing. So her response to the queen player's display of devotion to her dying husband is a key line. So at the very, very, uh, t uh, 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 towards the end of the play, rather, um, when they, everyone's watching the, the, the play within a play, uh, the dumb show and then the play, and, and the, the player queen uh, is protesting that I will never marry again once you die, my beloved husband, because I love you so much. Now, there's, that's the mousetrap scene, of course, where Hamlet's trying to, to catch the conscience of the king. Depending on the performance, uh, th her response could, mean, could, could, could portray several different motives, several different uh, character traits uh, all at once. It's amazing. So depending on the performance, uh, her response could suggest that she has an unromantic, pragmatic view of marriage, at least compared to King Hamlet's idealized view of marriage. Now, the, the, the player queen says here, both here and in the afterworld, pursue me lasting eternal strife if a widow ever I become a wife. So damn me to hell if I ever marry again. And then Hamlet says, how like you this play, um, mother. So there's a, a very romanticized, idealized version of love, kind of what we just saw with the troubadours, do you see? An expression of true, eternal, cosmic, transcendent love is what the player queen professes. And how does Gertrude respond? Quite coldly, with a cold, cynical contempt for that naive, romantic view of love. She says, the lady doth protest too much, methinks. I think this is BS, is kind of what she's saying, do you see? Uh, so she has a much more pragmatic view of love. Now, whether or not that pragmatism veers into the realm of cold, clinical, opportunist cynicism is another is another question. So does this reveal her guilt? Is she, is she herself protesting too much because she feels guilty? Does it just, is it simply annoyance at a, at a naive boy of a son who doesn't understand love and practical matters at all? Is it a dry Machiavellian disdain for this romantic view of marriage? Really, really interesting. That's a, that's a key scene and you can unpack that and talk about it forever. Uh, some more evidence in Act 4, Scene 5, uh, when things are really, really falling apart, uh, uh, she's politically engaged and she's contemptuous of the common people. Uh, the, 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 the mob of common people are protesting outside the gates or outside uh, or in the courtyard or wherever, uh, and they're calling for Laertes to be king. And that, you know, my dynasty... You're, there's a threat to my dynasty, she kicks into overdrive politically, again suggesting that she's a shaker and a mover like everyone else. She's politically engaged and contemptuous of the common people when her family's power is challenged. The mob calls for Laertes to be king and she reveals for the first time a real nasty arrogance and a quick temper. Interesting. These have only been re re reserved, these characteristics have been reserved for, for Claudius, uh, maybe King Hamlet and Hamlet himself. And now we see Gertrude uh, revealing a flash of that. So Gertrude says, how cheerfully the false trail they cry. Oh, this is counter, you false Danish dogs. And it's, it's, an, it's an image of uh, 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 hunting with, with, uh, with, with hounds, do you see? And you're following the wrong path. You're on the wrong scent. You're going backwards. This is counter. You're going backwards, you stupid, stupid rabble, is what she's saying. Uh, 
A play about Gertrude would reveal more of this now. That would be interesting. And maybe somebody has written a play somewhere uh, uh, called Gertrude instead of Hamlet. And would it reveal more of this Machiavellian moving and shaking, do you see? Really, really interesting if you, if you, dig, into these, if you dig into these quotes. Um, and lastly, Gertrude has no time for the distraught Ophelia until Horatio points out that Ophelia's ravings may threaten her political position by spreading damaging rumors. This is really true as well. Uh, again, in Act 4, Scene 5, uh, when, when um, uh, somebody says, you know, Gertrude, a gentleman says, uh, Gertrude wants, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Ophelia wants to speak with you. And she says, no, I'm not going to speak with her. And the gentleman says, she is importunate indeed distract her mood need will needs be pitied you you have to you have to you have to she's having a hard time she doesn't say okay bring her in she says well what does she want what does she want she really doesn't want to talk to her now what convinces her to 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 say let her come in is the gentleman sorry is uh the, the gentleman explains what she's doing she's she's ripping her psychically she's having a total nervous breakdown she's insane and speaking things that she shouldn't be speaking and and gertrude only says okay yeah yeah bring her in when horatio reminds her that to her good she were spoken with for she may strew dangerous conjectures in ill breeding minds if we don't tamp down if we don't do damage control here she may spread bad rumors that might hurt your uh, political position gertrude so there it is again it's the same thing and in actually in the 2009 version penny uh, the director has penny downey speak these lines in which case she's even more of a machiavellian mover and shaker and trying to protect her political position uh when she says we well, yeah, i would let i better talk to her because otherwise uh, 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 it could do some political damage. Uh, and in some books, there, there is some debate on whether or not it's Horatio's line or uh, um, Gertrude's line. In most of the books that I've read, though, it is indeed Horatio's mind, which sheds light on, on Horatio's character as well. And I've talked about that in other characters in, in other videos, and I'll talk about it in my coming Horatio video too. All right, so is, does, she let Gertrude, uh, does she let Ophelia come in out of concern for Ophelia? If so, why was she hesitant? Even she, she's having a hard time, of course, so that might explain it. All right, so again, everything with Shakespeare is, is hard to pin down. Uh, but yeah, if she was really, really concerned about her, she, she might have she might have re reacted more quickly. Okay, savvy self-preservation. Some women will do anything. Remember, you know this. You've watched Game of Thrones. You know what what powerful, political, ambitious women are like. Uh, if you haven't seen Succession, I strongly recommend it. It's one of the most Shakespearean uh, 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 dramas we have uh, today. There's a lot of good drama out there, a lot of crap drama, of course, but a lot of really good, true to life, true to human nature. True to human nature uh, is Succession. And she is very much, uh, uh, the, these. Uh, they are both these, these kinds of uh, uh, creatures who will cling to power and advantage and opportunity uh, fiercely. So some women, of course, men, we're not talking about men here, we're talking about women. We have to remember that women are not all gentle and soft and, and lovely, naive Ophelias. There's a lot of, of, of Circes out there as well. So some women will do anything to maintain their queenship. Like other tragic, now she, uh, Gertrude is tragic, which means non-psychopathic. She's a psychopath. So she doesn't feel any remorse for anything she does. She'll kill anybody and feel zero remorse. She'll feel grief that her son died or whatever uh, but no remorse no remorse so she she is a psychopath uh, I'm not sure if she's a psychopath or not you'll have to go watch it and tell me what you think anyway like other tragic figures uh, Gertrude suffers for her, her ambition her betrayals her errors and her self betrayals that's 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 Shakespearean not just when you betray someone else that's easy to write when you betray yourself that's that's a harder story to write and it's more true to, and more interesting dc so here she's suffering greatly of course she says in an aside so she's not talking to anybody she's not trying to impress anybody she's actually her soul is sick to my sick soul uh, this is after uh uh the gentleman and horatio leave to bring ophelia in she says to my sick soul uh as sin's true nature is, each toy seems prologue to some great amiss. So every little trifle thing that in news that gets announced, my guilty soul, my sick soul jumps to attention and, and imagines something terrible happening. So she's, she's having a nervous breakdown, obviously. So full of artless jealousy is guilt. It spills itself and fearing to be spilt. So that's the guilt she feels. Uh, Shiv in uh, a succession doesn't feel guilt in that sense, she feels a lot of other things, but not not guilt. I don't think. I don't. I don't know. Again, she's. This show is as again. It's as complex uh, in its depiction of human nature as as uh, as Shakespeare. I think. 
Some shows do that. Uh, her, no guilt at all, of course. No guilt at all. All right, we'll end with the Oedipal mother problem. Very, very interesting. There's lots of evidence to demonstrate that Hamlet is indeed stuck in a, in a complex Oedipal problem with his mom. Uh, but there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that it's the fault of the mother. But there is some, so we're going to look at that today. So first, um, if you want to know more about the Oedipal complex, look at my video. I've got more details on that. Uh, but in a nutshell, uh, it, the, the idea of the Oedipal complex comes from ancient Greek mythology. Uh, and, and Freud noticed this in Hamlet, by the way. Uh, and this, this is about Hamlet. Um, uh, but he also noticed it in the Greek myths, and myths are, are you know, they're, they're projections of our psychologies and our dreams, and our dreams reflect our psychologies, and, and, and there's some truth to it, I think. Uh, so Oedipus's fate, he was the king of ancient Athens, uh, no, sorry, Thebes, uh, he, and Oedipus was the king, and he ended up murdering his father, and he married his mother. Yeah, okay, psychologically, what do you do with that? Well, if you're Freud, here's what you do with it. Oedipus's fate moves us only because it could have been our own fate as well. We all want to kill our fathers and marries or mo marry our mothers. That's what Freud said, basically. Because at our birth, the oracle pronounced the same curse upon us as it did upon Oedipus, King Oedipus. The oracle said, it was perhaps ordained that we should all of us turn our first sexual impulses, impulses towards our mother, our first hatred and violent wishes against our father, because the father is in the way of our relationship with our mother. Our dreams convince us of it, says Freud. King Oedipus, who killed his father Laius and married his mother Jocasta, is only the fulfillment of our childhood wish. wish. Very, very interesting stuff. And again, we, he saw it in our myths and our stories, and perhaps there's some truth to it. So the question is, uh, uh, what kind of damage can the Oedipal mom do? Uh, parent as villain is the mo it is, is, is one of the most common stories involving parents because it is a fictionalized account of our struggle of a struggle that we must all undergo. We, all of us have to separate from the parent, the mother and the father. And it's a hard, hard, vicious, violent, psychological, you know, psychologically violent struggle. It's a big one. And so uh, 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 stories reveal this for us. And Hansel and Gretel uh, re re uh, reveals that struggle. Uh, depicts that struggle. Uh, the brilliant movie and book, uh, Coraline, uh, depict that struggle as well. It's all over the place. Uh, from the male perspective, the father perspe perspective, the tyrant dragon parent prevents youth from achieving selfhood. No, I'm sorry, that, that can be both the mother or the father. Uh, and and the, 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 the domineering parent who, who has their clutches in their, in their child uh, can prevent them from becoming uh, themselves. And so the, the, young, the young people, youths, starting in adolescence, start to feel that tension and they start to, that's where the hostility of adolescence comes from. It's that tension. It's the, the, the desire for the young person to escape the clutches of the parent, mother or father. Uh, the, the parent, the tyrant, dragon parent can usurp the child's will for their own aggrandizement and benefit. Uh, here's from the Harry Potter depiction of it. This is a brilliant image from the uh, from the movie, uh, Malfoy, uh, the poor boy who's under the thumb of his father, the smaller cage, and the larger cage, of course, is Voldemort, who has everyone uh, uh, trapped. And so remember, Malfoy, you are not you, you are me, says the tyrant parent. That's what the tyrant parent says. Son, daughter, you're not you. You are an extension of me, and you shall behave accordingly. So the great father, there's, there's a positive aspect of the great father, and there's a positive aspect of the great mother, and those are depicted in our stories in Dumbledore and, uh, 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 and all of the other great uh, uh, um, mother and father characters. Uh, but in the negative aspect, uh, Voldemort is a tyrant, Sauron in Lord of the Rings, Darth Vader in the Star Wars series, that's the tyrant uh, father. Uh, the, the devouring mother, as we've talked about, the other mother in Coraline, Hansel and Gretel, uh, the witch who fattens up their kids. Oh, look, here's a, here's a nice sweet house. Stay here forever and I will eat you up because you will be mine forever. Uh, the Joker movie depicts that as well. Uh, and lots of Disney moms are those uh, 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 jealous, jealous moms who don't want their daughters to uh, become greater than they are, uh, uh, more beautiful uh, and more successful. So they try to consume their daughters. Uh, the demands of the father, the cage within the cage. Those demands of the father. Okay, so how does that apply to Hamlet? Uh, Claudius is certainly Voldemort, very, very obviously. He's he's the villain. He's he's Voldemort. He's usurping the energies of all of Denmark for his own self-aggrandizement. But Gertrude is a devouring mother demanding, but is Gertrude a demanding mother devouring Hamlet, demanding that he live for her sake alone? Perhaps this image captures it. The director and Penny Downey understand here that this is what's happening. They're a little bit too close here. 
She's saying, don't go, don't go, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me in our lovely little sugar house. We can stay here forever, can't we, son? You can be my baby forever. You do love me, don't you? Don't go, we have sweets, there's the temptation. Yeah, it, it happens a lot, ladies and gentlemen. Look around, look around. You'll see it all over the place. So here's Claudia saying, for our intent at the beginning, this is the scene. Claudia says, don't go to Wittenberg. We want you to stay here. And the mother chimes in and says, let not your mother lose thy prayers, her prayers. Do you see the focus on herself here? Don't let me be sad. Don't let me be sad. Why would you make me sad, Hamlet? Why would you go away and make me sad? Don't you love me? Aren't you a good boy? I pray thee, stay with me, go not to Wittenberg. I will be sad if you go, so therefore you can't become who you are. You can't develop as a man. You have to stay. And what does Hamlet do? He fails. Uh, he says, I shall do my best to obey you, madam. It's a failure of individuation. It's a failure to separate from the parent, do you see? Imagine if Harry Potter stayed with the Dursleys. It's the same thing. Harry Potter stays with the Dursleys, doesn't go to Hogwarts, and becomes a good little boy being a waiter for uh, the Dursleys. That's, that's, that's as big a psychological problem as we're talking about here. So Hamlet is an artsy academic type. He's suited, uh, he's suited to the world of academia or drama off at the university, philosophy. He's that kind of guy, and he's not suited to the cutthroat world of politics, as we see throughout the play. Gertrude's devouring love prevents Hamlet from realizing his true potential, that failure of individuation, that failure of separation. And it's the claws, the clutches of the, of the mother that does it in this case. Fathers, tyran tyrannical fathers have the same kind of problem, but we're talking with the mom at this moment. So, uh, it was, but, but that, that's just a suggestion. I mean, again, like, like Shakespeare's a troll. He's trolling us. Is, is this really the problem? Is it the mother's fault or is it Hamlet's pathologies? And probably it's more Hamlet's pathologies. Uh, but, but nevertheless, they're, they're, they're there and the suggestions are there too, uh, that it is Gertrude's problem. A fault. Hamlet's sexual pathologies seem to suggest he is indeed trapped in Freud's Oedipal complex. He has obsessive attention. Now I have to prove that there is a, an Oedipal situation going on. And again, I do that more in my Oedipal video, but 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 have a look in here really quickly. So he, he has an obsessive attention to the details of his mother's sex life, and that reveals a hidden repressed desire that Freud talked about. He actually wants to sleep with her. He's he, As you'll see here, he, he's when he's yelling at her in the closet scene, He's, he, he can't, he's, he's actually almost, he's only, he's actually kind of talking to himself, himself, himself here. He's imagining in a, quite a lot of detail him having sex, uh, his mother having sex with somebody, which is not healthy. I mean, we had one of the, one of the things we have to accept when we hit adolescence and we realize that our parents are sexual creatures, it disgusts us. But if we mature in a healthy way, we realize, yeah, that's, yeah, duh, we're physical animals and that's, that's the way it goes. But Hamlet is trapped in this, this, this desire, his, his repressed desire for his mom, and he can't stand the fact that she's having sex with somebody else. So nay, to live in, a, in the rank sweat of an enseamed bed, stewed in corruption, hunting and making love over the nasty sty. I mean, that's, that's not a mature, healthy view of sex at all. And it's similar to the way his father depicted sex as, as garbage, eating garbage, eating the guts of the body. It's a bodily thing. There's a bodily di disgust here that Hamlet and the father have, do you see? So the juxtaposition of, these, of, the, of the bed as a pigsty, uh, the honey is now corrupt and love is not love. It's something nasty, do you see? So that, that suggests that he's, 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 he's having a psychological hard time with sex. Uh, and it continues, let not the blow king tempt you to bed again. Don't let him pinch your cheek wantonly, call you his mouse and let him for a pair of reachy kisses. He's imagining Claudius kissing her and her liking it or paddling in your neck with his damned fingers. Don't let him seduce you into revealing the secrets that I have to say. So again, there's an, a, an obsessive attention to the details of her sex life that suggests that it's not healthy. Uh, this is brilliant. Uh, probably the director and Penny Downey decided to act uh, in this particular way. Stop at mom, it's gross is basically what he's saying. And here, that expression says, boy, oh boy, boy, grow up, grow up, young man. You have no idea what you're talking about. You do not know. I love Claudius and I lust after Claudius. And what are you going to do about it, son? Do you see the problem here? It's really, really interesting. So again, we can come back to the question of whether or not it's Hamlet's problem or did Gertrude smother him in an Oedipal kind of way, Oedipal mom kind of way. So how to grow up? For the youth to fully mature, as I've said, they have to symbolically kill their parents. They do. They have to kill their parents. They have to break the psychic grip 
uh, that both the mother and the father can have on them. And failure results in absolute tragedy, a failure of separation, as we see here. Now, interestingly, in Hamlet, uh, he, does, he does succeed. He separates and he becomes his own man, uh, uh, but only after everybody dies, not just symbolically, but everybody has to die physically, including himself. So Hamlet's final acts are those of a mature, autonomous, kingly man. It's really interesting, but of course they come too late. He says on his dying breath, just before this screenshot is taken, he says, I do prophesy the election lights on Fortinbras. As king, I give the election of the crown of Denmark to good old Fortinbras. That's a kingly declaration. So he does become himself, but everybody has to literally die, not symbolically die. So who is to blame? Gertrude for her Oedipal grip on, uh, that she had on her son or Hamlet for his own failure to recognize and correct his own pathologies and grow up. That's what we do. We recognize them as we go through adolescence and enter uh, young adulthood. Uh, we, we do. We, we reconcile these issues. It, it's torturous and it's sometimes more torturous than other times, but it's something that we all have to do. Uh, the great, uh, the, the, what, what a parent would do ideally is they would voluntarily remove themselves. And I've talked about this in other videos. Uh, Dumbledore is the great example of that. Dumbledore, one of his last words is please. And it means please kill me. I want to die. So Harry Potter can't become Harry Potter until the father Dumbledore gets out of the way. And then Harry Potter will become the master, do you see? That's what a good parent does. And I've looked at that in other videos as well. It's really interesting and important. All right, that was Five Quote Shakespeare, Hamlet, Character Analysis, Gertrude. I hope you found the video useful. And if you did, please like and subscribe. And uh, don't forget to pick up a copy of the PDFs if you need them. Thanks for watching.